India Legal Stories That Count. Hello and welcome to another special readout session from India Legal Magazine. As you all know, we are the nation's first independent political legal weekly covering controversial issues of national and international importance. Our readers sometimes tell us we are too serious a publication. And we should also carry features in a lighter vein. Well, I agree with them. It is true we do not provide infotainment. We focus on serious reading. But I also agree we can lighten up a little and spark some mirth and laughter, share some wit and wisdom. So uh, here's a small beginning. The matter was sent to us by one of our most prolific writers, Justice Kamaljeet Garewal. He was a former senior judge of the Punjab and Haryana High Court. And uh, some of his pronouncements and, and observations are widely celebrated. Courts are often seen as dry places, swarming with serious men and women in black robes, debating contentious disputes. But genius blooms in strange places. And UK courts, United Kingdom that is, have shown the witty side of things. So here are some gems picked out for us and for you by Judge Garewal. They are legal terms used as um, headlines or titles, followed by explanations and uh, brief uh, pithy uh, commentaries. So here goes. This, this is from R.C. Megary, QC's Miscellany. All right, here's a subhead. Lawyer's library, definition. The practicing lawyer must, to some extent, share the responsibility for writing of law books. Head notes rearranged vertically make a digest. Head notes rearranged horizontally make a textbook. Textbooks rearranged alphabetically make an encyclopedia. Every few years, some investigator has to break up one of these works into its constituent atoms, add some more head notes from recent decisions, stir well, and give us the latest book on the subject. And so, law libraries grow. Yet, even the most authoritative works, a genius sometimes blooms in strange places. Another headline, judicial process. What does it mean? Well, here's our definition. Much has been spoken on the course of the judicial process. One may begin with two remarks of the great Holmes, Judge Holmes. I recognize without hesitation that judges do and must legislate, but they do so only interstitially. They are confined from moor to molecular motions. A common law judge should not say, I think the doctrine of consideration is a bit of, quote, historical nonsense and shall not enforce it in my court, unquote. Again, the vindication of the obvious is sometimes more important than the elucidation of the obscure, unquote. At times, however, even truth itself may be spurned. I quote again, truth, like all other good things, may be loved unwisely, may be pursued too keenly, may cost too much. And surely the meanness and the mischief of a prying into a man's of, of, of prying into a man's confidential consultations with his legal advisor, the general evil of infusing reserve and dissimulation, uneasiness and suspicion and fear into those communications which must take place and which, unless in a condition of perfect security, must take place uselessly or worse are too great a price to pay for the truth itself. I know that's long and it's a tongue twister, so maybe you'll want to listen to it again. You can reverse and listen to it. I'll go on. The next topic, damages. Now, it's well known that the Court of Appeal will normally not interfere with an award of damages unless they appear to have been assessed on a wrong principle. In one case, uh, in which Mr. F. E. Smith, KC, had appeared for the defense, damages of a million pounds 
uh, sorry, that's a, uh, I think that was a thousand pounds, had nevertheless been awarded. Uh, now, on appeal, Hamilton, LJ, learned judge, remarked, it is said that the defendant's counsel set the jury against him by, Im by the impetuosity of his attack on the plaintiffs and that, he, and that the jury could inflame the damages for that. Still, in my opinion, by no formula or manipulation can uh, 1,000 be uh, got at. For any damages really done, uh, 1,000 was quite enough. Double it for sympathy. Double it again for the jury's sense of the defendant's conduct and again for their sense of uh, Mr. F. E. Smith's. The product is only 801, unquote. A new trial was accordingly ordered, but on appeal uh, to the House of Lords, it held that the defendants were entitled to judgment. Lord Buckmaster, LC, began his speech by saying, my lords, this case affords the under, the, uh, this case, um, if I remember correctly, this case affords the unedifying spectacle of litigation conducted with such disregard of the rules of procedure that extrication from the resulting tangle has, all, has been all but hopeless. And Lord Atkinson's opening shot was that, quote, the suit out of which this appeal has arisen was wrongly framed, was unsatisfactorily conducted, and has led to illegal, if not indeed absurd, results. Uh, here's another uh, subhead. Of cats and dogs, rats and rabbits. Figure this one out. It is an understandable human habit to illustrate the characteristics of fellow men by reference to the animal world. And lawyers are no exception to this rule. One well-known instance lies in the sphere of landlord and tenant. In assessing the compensation payable by a landlord to an outgoing tenant of, of, of business premises under the Landlord and Tenant Act 1927 in respect of goodwill, what had to be discovered was the goodwill that had become, quote unquote, attached to the premises. Now, in one case, Scrutton, learned judge, referred to the argument that goodwill must be considered on a cat dog and rat basis. The cat prefers the old home to the person who keeps it and stays in the old home to, uh, uh, though the person who has kept the house leaves. The cat represents that, that part of the customers who continue to go to the old shop, uh, though the old shopkeeper has gone. The probability of their custom may be regarded as an additional value given to the premises by the tenants trading. And the dog? Well, the dog represents that part of the customers who follow the person rather than the place. Uh, these tenants uh, may take away with him or with them if they do not go too far. There remains a class of customer who may neither follow the place nor the person but drift away elsewhere. They're neither a benefit to the landlord nor the tenant and have been called uh, the rat for no particular reason except to keep the epigram in the animal kingdom. I believe my brother Mom has introduced the rabbit, but I will leave him to explain the position of the rabbit. That's been left to Mom. The exposition by Mom, learned judge, was that, I, I explained this and I'm quoting him, the rabbit indicates the customers who come simply from propinquity to the premises. And if this is borne in mind, it will be apparent that the rabbit may be much bigger than the cat, who, if indeed it does not wholly vanish, may well shrink to the dimensions of a mouse." Unquote. Such an indignity might indeed prove fatal to any right-thinking cat. Some years afterwards, Evershed, learned judge, and his brethren in the Court of Appeals regarded the cat with critical appraisal and said, uh, here's another quote. If it is true that a cat has nine lives, we express the hope that in relation to the landlord and the and tenant act, it has, it has lived the last of them and may now be decently interred. Seven years later, the legislature 
considerably uh, repealed the relevant provisions of the Act, but unfeelingly inserted uh, in the new Act a provision which some may regard as a last departing flicker of the statutory ninth life. Uh, here's the other topic. Drafting legislation. Definition. There is authority for saying that, quote, uh, the language of statutes is peculiar and that even a casual inspection of the law uh, reports is likely to reveal that the courts do not invariably display a deep reverence for every product uh, on the um, on the uh, uh, on the art of a parliamentary council uh, in a sense the scales are um, heavily weighted against the draftsman if he has made himself plain uh, there is likely to be no litigation so none to praise him whereas if he has fallen into confusion or obscurity, the reports will probably record the results of the fierce and critical intellects of both bar and bench being brought to bear on his work. Yet, the debt owed to him by the legal profession is incalculable. He has been pictured as happily singing to himself, I am the parliamentary draftsman, I compose the country's laws, and on, on uh, half the litigation, I'm absolutely the cause. At times, the bench has seemed somewhat severe, as when in, the, in, in a case concerning the property legislation of 1925, Judge Asbury observed, this is Judge Asbury, this interesting question is considerably complicated by the simplifications introduced by the new property legislation. See, if you can figure that out. Precedence from time to time, precedence, that's, 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 that's the other, other topic, precedence, P, not precedence, precedence, P-R-E-C-E-D-E-N-T-S, here's a definition, from time to time the courts yield to temptation. Lord Birkenhead, L.C., once said of uh, uh, Lord uh, Chesham's state, uh, settlement, it may without excessive irony be said that it has been distinguished with more zest than it has been followed. And Judge Blackburn once observed to the counsel in the course of argument, Rich versus Bastofield is the only case at all in your favor. And I think that is a desperate refinement. <laughs> in Scotland, Episcopal table manners have been invoked. Lord Pitfor once referred to an earlier decision which is contrary to his own view as being a case in which uh, the bench was divided and the decision was not relished. A decision is an arbitrary question, uh, is of great authority, uh, not so when pronounced on wrong principles. The cause was not fully pleaded at first, and some judges are like the old bishop, who having begun to eat the asparagus at the wrong end, uh, did not choose to alter. But it was Baron Bramwall who so majestically demonstrated how to dispose of previous decisions of his own, uh, which were inconsistent with the view he was taking in the case before him. He simply said, the matter does not appear to me now as it appears to have appeared to me then. Well, if you did not get a few laughs out of that, I hope you certainly got <laughs> some snickers. And the English here is not the usual English you hear, uh, but the King's English or the Queen's English as spoken uh, by the learned uh, judges and, and, and gentlemen uh, who run the court system in England. So if you want another laugh, go through this again, listen to it carefully, and I hope you enjoy it. This is Indrajit Badwar. Until next time, goodbye. India Legal Stories That Count